In this session, we will see how to solve for a hydrothermal system using the algorithm I developed in the previous session. So the system we consider is as follows. I have taken the fundamental hydrothermal system. That means there is one uh, hydel plant and one thermal plant. And the objective is to find the optimal generation schedule. That means how much the hydel plant should generate, how much the thermal plant should generate. Wherein the load varies in steps of eight hours each as seven megawatts, 10 megawatts and five megawatts. So that means there are three periods there are three periods. So in the in one period, the demand is seven megawatt and in the other it is 10 and in the other it is five. So each is eight hours duration. So our sub intervals is three. Now there is no water in flow into the reservoir of the hydro plant. That means there is nothing coming in. Okay. Uh, the initial water storage in the reservoir is 100 meter cube per second. You remember we converted the storage from volume to discharge rate. And the final water storage should be 60 meter cube per second. That means you cannot allow it to go lower. So in essence, it means that you only have 40 meter cube per second available for hydro generation during the day. And the head of the water is 20 meters. And you can assume the correction factor is 0 0.005. And the non-effective water discharge is 2 meter cube per second. That is, this is the amount of discharge you have to maintain for your no load. Okay. And the incremental fuel cost of the thermal plant is given by DC by dPHT is 1 plus 1 PGT plus 25 rupees per hour. So we have all the data. So now let us see systematically, step by step, how I do the, uh, get the optimal solution. I will show you for one iteration, you can continue uh, for the other iterations. So now I have three sub intervals, three sub intervals. And as we discussed in the algorithm, Q1, let it be dependent, I will independently solve for Q2 and Q3. Right. So let me assume an initial discharge rate of 15 meter cube per second, both. I think you can choose even 10, 12, whatever you want reasonable because you know the total available or, you know discharge is 40 meter cube per second so obviously it will be very silly if you assume something like 100 or 1 or 0.5 so that's what i meant when i said you start off with a reasonable assumption you can assume any arbitrary value also only thing is it will take a lot more iterations okay so this is the first step i have assumed q2 and q3 next i find out q1 so q1 is uh, x naught minus xm so initial storage is 100 final is uh, uh, 60 minus sigma qm except m equal to 1 so i get 10 meter cube per second so now i have an initial estimate of the discharge in all the three periods okay next so i have x naught initial storage is 100 x3 final storage 60 and we have the equation xm minus xm minus 1. So here you, you know that there is no inflow in the data given. So j will be 0. So from this, I can write x1. Okay. That is the storage at the time period 1. I need all these data to calculate the hydro generation. x1, you just write substitute for m equal to 1 in this equation. I get x1 equal to x0 plus j1 minus q1 okay x0 is 100 j1 is 0 q1 is 10 so i get x1 is 90. similarly if i substitute m equal to 2 i get x2 equal to take the rest to the right hand side x1 plus j2 minus q2 right j2 is 0 and x1 you have already solved as 90 and Q2 is, you have assumed to be 15, so it is 75. So you see, I know the initial storage, I know the final storage. I am trying to get how the storage is depleted in intermediate sub-intervals. Okay, 
So that's what we are doing here. So next you calculate this. X3 you already know. X3 is given to you. X0 is also given to you. So now I know the storage at all the time intervals. Next I obtain the hydro generations. So this is the equation for the hydro generation. I have put it again for your clarity. So PGH, I have H0 is 9.81 into 10 to the power of minus 3 H0 prime where this is the basic ed and I have x plus xm plus xm minus 1 into qm minus rho. So now let us see using this equation how I calculate the generations for all the three sub intervals. So qgh of 1 so this is 9.81 into 10 to the power of minus 3 and the head is given to be 20 into 1 plus 0.5 into 0 0.005, okay? The error is given to be 0 0.005, this is a part of the data given to you. And M is one, so I'll have X1 plus X0 into Q1 minus rho, right? You know everything, substitute for this, and I get PGH, that means the hydel generation in the first sub-interval is 2.315 megawatts. Okay, next. Similarly, I substitute PGH2. All these will remain the same, except that this will become X2 plus X1. Okay, M is now 2. X2 plus X1, and this would be Q2 minus rho. So substituting, I get 3.602 megawatts. And similarly, calculate PGH of 3. Okay, so in the third step, calculate what are all the hydro generations, right? Very clear, you see it is very systematic, this algorithm. Next, I calculate the thermal generations. So what are the two generations I have? I have the two generations are hydel and thermal. The generation at any instant must be equal to loss plus demand. So here no data is given about loss. Otherwise, so we will assume the loss to be zero, transmission loss to be zero. Otherwise, you know the loss equation. The loss equation, if you are given the loss coefficients, B coefficients, you can calculate the loss equations. And then you can find out what is the thermal generation. So the thermal generation is PD minus PGH. Actually, it would be PD plus PL. PL is the loss. Here, I don't have loss. So it is simply PD minus PGH. So I get the thermal generations in all the three sub intervals. Okay, so next what I know, I have this equation, the first, the derivative of the Lagrangian function with respect to the thermal generation. I can find this out, use this to find out lambda one of M. So if losses are neglected, this term would become zero. So I'll simply have lambda, Lambda 1 of M will be PGT of M plus 25 because this term is 0, P, dou PL by dou PGT is 0. So I'll have Lambda 1 of M is equal to DC by DPGT, which is given to be PGT plus 25. So I have Lambda 1 of M is equal to PGT of M plus 25. I already know the generations at all the three intervals so I can find out lambda 1 of 1, lambda 1 of 2, and lambda 1 of 3. So these are the Lagrange multipliers in the three sub intervals. Clear? Now, so this is the second step and the third step. Next step, next Lagrange multiplier. You find out the derivative of the Lagrange with respect to PGH. I have already derived the expressions. And in this, dou PL by dou PGH is equal to zero because the losses are neglected. And therefore, you get lambda 1 of M is equal to lambda 3 of M. So I have lambda 3 of 1, lambda 3 of 2, and lambda 3 of 3. All the three are calculated, right? Next, what I do, I find out the derivative with respect to Q1. And I get from this, I have to find out lambda 2 of 1. So I have lambda 2 of 1. So Q1, remember, is a dependent variable. It's a dependent variable. So I substitute for this. All the values are known. 
right? Substituting, I get lambda 2 of 1 is 8.474. Next, what I do, I have do L by do XM for all, like this. So I need to calculate the lambda 2 in the next two subintervals, in 2 and 3. So I use this equation. So you see here, lambda 2 of 1 minus lambda 2 of 2 minus lambda 3 of 1 will give me. So I write two equations. And using these equation, I get lambda 2 of 2. I solve. So I get lambda 2 of 2 and lambda 2 of 3. So now I have computed the Lagrangian multiplier for all the sub-intervals. Clear? So next I have to calculate the gradient vector. So I have an expression for the gradient vector, right? I find out for the intervals lambda L with respect to Q2 and with respect to Q3 and both are not close to zero. So you have to take the derivative only with respect to independent variables. And the only two independent variables are Q2 and Q3. So you need to update only Q2 and Q3. Since the gradient vector is not close to zero, we have to update Q. So how do I update Q? Q2 new is Q2 old minus alpha into do L by do Q2, so on. So here, the main thing is alpha. So I have chosen alpha to be 0.5, right? So if you choose a very small value, it is very good. You will get convergence. If you choose a large value, you may oscillate. I told you in the last uh, lecture. So what will happen is you will jump from, when you're close to the optimal point, you will jump from below the optimal point to above. So you will keep on oscillating. So maybe what you could do is you, uh, take a small value or uh, you take a large value of lambda, right? First two, three iterations, you use a large value. And as, as your gradient vector reduces, you, you change the alpha to a smaller value so that you don't get into oscillations. Okay. So here you're trading off initially by assuming a large value of alpha, you're trying to reduce the number of iterations. And then when you're closer to the solution by switching on to a smaller value of alpha, you're ensuring that you do not get into oscillations. Okay, so this is how you update. So now I update Q, Q nu one is this value. So Q2 nu I have, Q3 nu I have, and Q1 nu is a dependent variable I update. So now I have the discharges at the end of the first iteration, right? So now what do I do? I go back. So using these discharges, I calculate the hydro generations and using that, I calculate the thermal generation. Then again, I calculate all the Lagrangian multipliers and again, I calculate the gradient vector and go to my, get the discharge at the end of the second iteration. And I go on doing it till the solution converges, which happens when the gradient vector is close to zero. Okay, so now here I consider an example without inflow and without losses. There is nothing extraordinary or anything different you have to do. If there is inflow, you only have some number for J. And if there is a loss, you have to include the loss when you compute the um, thermal plant. And the loss can be easily computed by using the expression for the losses from the loss coefficients. Thank you.